Um, my name is Oli, and I am my SQL consultant at a small, small Swiss company uh, called From Dual. And what we do is basically anything about my SQL. I have no clue about next cloud. I have no clue about development. I only have a little clue about my SQL, so that's our business. So I'm here to talk about my SQL or whatever data store you use for next cloud. Um, I had a little problem. I don't know if there is a developer here or users. So who is developers of Nextcloud? In this corner? OK, so a few people. Uh, who is user? OK, the majority. So I'm sorry for the majority of you. Maybe it's not so much for you, but let's have a look. So what I want to talk uh, to you about in the next few minutes is about database scalability. I've heard that database scalability is a problem for Nextcloud. Is this true? Or is this a rumor? Or not true? OK, I don't know. OK, so it depends. You are a consultant, right? No? <laughs> not really. OK. <laughs> let's, let's have a look. So what I want to talk about is uh, critical resources, so performance and performance patterns. High, high availability and performance and what is evil. So part of this, you as a user can influence, but not much. And most of that, you as a developer can influence. So we have to have a talk or uh, have a look about it. Critical resources. Uh, typically in hardware, there are four of those. Uh, this is RAM, the I.O. system, uh, CPU, and the network. So let's start with the RAM. Uh, databases really love RAM, memory. And here we can typically say much helps more. So as more memory you have in the database server, as better the performance can become. That's not a MySQL advice. Every database consultant will tell you this. OK. Um, so ideally, all your database set should or could fit into the memory. So that leads to the question, how much RAM do you have for your, for your next cloud database server? And how big is your next cloud database? Please let me know. I have no clue about next cloud, to be honest. So how much RAM do you have for your database servers, please? 65 gigabyte of RAM. OK, sounds not too bad. 100 gigabyte of database. Is that a big setup or small setup? I have no clue. Medium? Again, it's depends. The number of users is about 250, 300 users. But not 1,000, 250, not 250,000. No, right, okay. Okay, but the files hopefully are not stored in the database, right? No, it's metadata. Okay, so, but 100 gigabyte next cloud is metadata for 250 users. That's uh, it's, it's extremely unusual. Okay, so. And that, that only means that are many years. I have seen bigger installations that usually have 100 gigabytes of database, but they also serve 10 to 20,000 users. Okay, so, so that's, sounds, that's, sounds that's, better. That's okay. a typical, so I guess that's a typical. We uh, had luck. Okay. <laughs> okay, so all your data sets should, should fit in the RAM. It's not possible. It still works, but as worse this relation becomes, as slower the database is. So ideally, all the hot data should fit in the RAM. And then the database is fast. And what the hot data set is, the developers should tell you, or can, or whatever. Uh, for you as a next cloud um, administrator, what is relevant here is InnoDB buffer pool size. This is the MySQL variable you have to configure properly according to your RAM. Uh, rule of thumb is 80% of your RAM on a dedicated database server should go into, go into the, this variable. Um, do you have some kind of installer for Nextcloud? Yes? No? How is it installed? I have no clue. Do you have an installer? Yes. Okay. It so doesn't, it doesn't configure the database. It, it does not configure. So who should do the database stuff? Yeah, the, the, the users. Yes. Yeah, the, the okay. Users also okay. The Feature database. request, you should have a proper installer. And then the installer should configure this variable properly. And until we have this feature request uh, implemented, your administrators, this variable should be set to 80% of your RAM on the dedicated MySQL only database server. The slides are online already. You don't have to make a snapshot of the slides. 
question? No? OK. Um, why RAM? We don't want to read from flow disks. We want to read from fast memory. Memory is roughly 100,000 times faster than disk, so we want to have our hot data set in RAM, and then the database become fast. The next thing in databases typically we care is the I.O. system, because if the data don't fit in RAM, they are on disk, and then it depends on the disk performance. Um, what typically databases do is they do asynchronous random writes and fast synchronous sequential writes on the redo logs. We don't want to read from the disk anymore. So your disk should be good in this. That means for us in hardware, we want to have dedicated disks, direct attached, fast means expensive, RAID 10 or better SSDs. And this is not what the trend goes with modern hardware and infrastructure because we want to have this cloud stuff and this ZAN stuff and this whatever. This is not what we want to have for best database performance. Now, cloud stuff and next cloud, I don't know how it matches because you do the infrastructure. ZAN is not a good idea, right? For the database, not for the file trash. Um, the reason we don't want to share, we don't want to wait for slow and far away, far away disks. So IO latency matters, SAN and cluster file system stuff for database is not a good idea. The next thing which is relevant is CPUs. Uh, fast cores process slow queries faster. So that means faster CPUs make your slow non-tuned queries faster and also the good tuned queries make them faster. So that means we don't want to have green IT for fast databases. Uh, so just for your imagination, four cores can run four queries at the same time and not more. And now my question is about Nextcloud and concurrency. I have seen an advice on your website that you, we need multi-core uh, multi-socket machines, right? Or we do every new request gets a new process. So okay. If the, if the, how many cores could have developed? Processes. Okay, so that means you have many threads which process many queries. Yes. Okay, so what is the concurrency? Active running queries. Do we have such numbers? Running, not connected, yes? Running. No, no, not really anymore. No, no, it's what you do, what the application does. It depends on the developers, what they do there. I will, ma uh, will, uh, will do an example later, okay? Uh, network, nowadays, from the data, uh, database side of you, we don't see any limits anymore with one gigabit and 10 gigabit networks. If you have other experience, please let me know. So that are the critical resources. So the presentation was about scalability and performance, so what does it mean? Because we found out that a lot of people have different understandings of performance and scalability. So when we talk about performance, uh, we have there two different meanings. Uh, the one is how fast is it, that's latency, and the other one is how many per time, that's the throughput. So it comes to your point, huh? So when we talk about database performance, how fast is my query? And how many queries do I run, or how many queries do I run per time? Scalability means to what point we will run at these two numbers, to what point? What amount of data, uh, what amount of transactions uses time, and so on and so forth? When is our system overloaded? That's the question of scalability. So if you have such a number, let's say concurrency and response time, and you increase the concurrency, concurrency at a certain point, you get this exponential uh, curve going up, and that's the saturation point. And if you go behind this point, performance will always be worse. So you have to know where this point is and never go ahead this point. Now, for you as a user, it's a little bit difficult. I don't know. Do you have such benchmarks that you can say 10,000 users with this and this hardware, you can go that and that far? Not yet? The hardware is too distributed to benchmark again. Okay. I, I think it depends on the, the architecture that is, that is set up and that is up to the, to the customer. To the users. users. Okay, so you have to do that. You have to find out where is your saturation point. Is it at 400 users, is it at 10,000 or at 250,000 users? You have to find it out. 
Do you have some benchmark tools for that, for the users? Yeah, we do, but we only have one kind of server. Yeah, but you provide them to the users? Not yet, but it's planned. OK, then, then they can find out that point. OK. Performance patterns, this is something you cannot do. That's for the developers. You have to recognize the performance patterns you have. Uh, read, is it a read problem? Is it a write problem? Is it a latency or is it a throughput problem? This is what you have to figure out, you think about when you develop stuff. Uh, in write, is it a latency or throughput problem? The same. Uh, so where do we suffer? Uh, what you also have to recognize is do we have random or sequential patterns? Maybe you know that sequential access typically is faster than random access, at least on the disk, but sometimes also in memory. It has to do with internal structures in databases and MySQL. So do we random fetch rows? Or your queries, do they fetch random rows? Do they random writes on disk? That are things you as a developer should consider. I'll show you a few more detailed points later. Do we sequential read, write, sequential full table scans, for example? Do we log writes to disk? So this is something you should keep in mind. Uh, caching effects, we see very often users doing micro benchmarks. They run a query, it's slow. They run it again and it's fast. And they say, oh, now it's fixed or we don't understand that. That's typically an effect of caches. Databases has a lot of caches. We have a file system cache, we have a cache on the IO system. We have a cache in the database, and then we have the query cache, which you probably advise to disable. I don't know. Or is it left to the users? The query cache is enabled, and the hit rate is quite high, because okay. most, most of the requests are reads for... Uh, that data. sounds good. So you know already about the patterns. That's not too bad. That's good. So that... One percent writes, and the rest is reads. Oh, that I, I really love to hear that. That's good. So that means uh, Nextcloud has a chance to scale, huh? Okay. <laughs> So what influences read? So what influences read latency? Indexes. So if your application has good indexes, and that's not you can influence, that's task of them. So kick them, make feature requests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If a database is indexed well, then it should be per performed fast. Then RAM access versus disk access influences read performance as well. RAM is roughly 100 times, 100,000 times faster than disk. So if you have your data in RAM, it will be faster. And complexity of query. Complex queries perform worse than simple queries. So the fastest query is a primary key access. And the slowest query is some used joins with subqueries and unions and so on and so forth. So what are you doing? OK, wonderful. So that is where MySQL really can scale. Good. Throughput. Uh, you told it already, or you, told, uh, you, you were speaking already about it. Uh, one connection to MySQL can process one query. That means one thread on the operating system. That means it uses one core. Up to now, MySQL, one query will only use one core. In MySQL 8, which came out this week, maybe this will change. We don't know yet. But up to, up to now, the developers have to spawn multi-threads, which do multi-connections, which do run multi-queries in parallel to really use the full power of your CPU and your hardware. So, and you say, it, yes, you're doing that already. So, OK, so maybe you will use the hardware. Just keep in mind, four queries can run, uh, four cores can run four queries at the same time. Um, a little bit more complicated. Four cores can process four seconds of queries in one second real time. Or if you think about that, 10,000 queries running each query one millisecond will run about two and a half seconds on a four core machine, probably more because of side effects. There are some frameworks. Uh, I think Java people like to use that, so no fear here, really, right? Uh, they do one click and then the framework does 10,000 queries on the database. Every query runs one millisecond and the user is wondering why is it taking 10 seconds or something like that. So be careful if you are using frameworks. Um, what is it? Come on. Yeah, what you can do in this case is either less queries or faster queries or faster cores or more cores. 
So variables influencing read performance, that's for you or for administrators. Uh, we are talking, uh, one, one more question to developers, we are talking about InnoDB only, right? No more anything else. Only on InnoDB, okay, perfect. Um, so what can we influence from the variable side? Query cache, uh, this typically improves read performance dramatically if you have always the same and the same and the same queries again. So your advice is enable the query cache, right? Uh, pay attention, MySQL 5.6, the query cache is disabled by default. That means you have to enable it if you migrate from MySQL 5.5 to 5.6. Uh, yeah, that's sad, but Oracle has decided to do that. Uh, pay attention, the query cache can be a bottleneck at high throughput and if you have a high write rate. So the query cache is good, always repeating queries and less writes, but it can be bad in the other way. So you have to know your pattern and you have to find out if query cache helps or makes you pain. You see that in the process list, there is a state called waiting for query cache mutex or something like that. If you see that very often, switch off query cache. Then table open cache, table definition cache, the new defaults are good. That means you should not misconfigure it. The new defaults means in MySQL 5.6 and later. Uh, table definition cache should as, be as big as table you have in your own next cloud instance. How many tables do you have? 200, 300, 400, 500, 1,000. 20, 20, 40, 60, 40. Not 1,000, 20. Um, okay, so the default are good. Okay, so a two number, dig, uh, two digit number. Okay, so the defaults are good for you. Do you have some multi, uh, how do you say, multi tenant setups? I think it's generally a new database per, a database per tenant. New schema per tenant, and you will have these multi tenant setups? or do you have such customers? Because multi-tenant setups, that can become an issue. If you have 10,000 tenants, and every tenant has 50 tables, you have 50, 500,000 tables, something like that. Yeah, it's, it's always it's also separate the Okay, so several tenants in one yeah. server. Okay, so you do sharding. Okay, very good, well done. Uh, table open cache, the defaults are good. So let's stop with that. Uh, Influencing read, I already told about, InnoDB buffer pool size should be 75 to 80% of your RAM, okay? And uh, if you have a lot of concurrency, InnoDB buffer pool instances should be age 16, depends on the number of cores, the defaults are good in five, six and later. So MySQL variables influencing write. We are just talking about InnoDB, nothing else, right? A uh, query cache can have a negative impact if you have a high write on a rate on write. Table open cache, table definition cache, the same rules as before. And now let's have a look at InnoDB writing. Uh, InnoDB flush log at transaction commit influences the behavior of InnoDB, how the data are written to the disk. That means either safe or fast, but not both. So you have to decide. As somebody few was about safety and security and no loss of data, was it you? What is your advice here? Okay, no advice, good, let's discuss. What about the users? Safety? safety? That means slow, huh? Fast or, fast or safe? You, you, know, you cannot have both, you have to decide. Both, okay. Depends. Uh, the default is uh, safe, so you're on the good side. If you have the right performance problem, the defaults are not optimal. Uh, set it to zero or two for getting better performance. With the impact, you can lose one to, let's say, 15 seconds of data in case of a crash. Is that acceptable? Depends on your business. How critical is it if you lose one to 15 seconds of data? It's not corrupted, it's just less lost. Is that a problem? Yes, no? Yes, okay, so you have to invest more in hardware. Then you can work around that. Okay. Uh, InnoDB log file size, before MySQL 5.6, the defaults were horribly bad. Okay, in 5.6, the defaults are much better. Uh, here we recommend a value between 64 max to 256 max. Do you huge data loads into Nextcloud? 
if you do this merging and federating stuff, will that impact or will that have an impact on huge data loads? Small chunks, okay. So you, you, huge imports or no? no. Okay, yeah. no. Yeah, in this case, yeah, yeah. That's all. yeah, that's all, but that's also something that yeah. many of the triggered by an admin who says, yeah, it's just we can now file this in the So he should know what he's doing then. Yeah, but if that's nothing we, uh, we do regularly. It's, it happens once a month or something. So what, what's the typical MySQL version they are using? 5.5 older or 5.6 newer? It okay. all, always depends on their, on their infrastructure. Some uh, require some older methods. I guess the 6 comes to 5.5? 5.1, 5.5, something like that, yeah. So. Okay. So the defaults are bad. Change the defaults to have bigger values here. Pay attention with MySQL 5.5 and older. It's a little bit tricky. Huh? You have to shut down the database, move the files, change the config, start again. 5.6, uh, it's uh, more relaxed. You have just to change the value and then restart the database and it's good. Okay. InnoDB buffer pool size also influences writes. Primarily, it influences reads, but also writes. If the data are on disk, then we have first to read it and then to write it and so on. So big buffer pool also helps to, helps to improve the reads. And is somebody using really huge IO systems or fast IO systems like SSDs? OK. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. SSD sounds good. Uh, InnoDB IO capacity increased that. The default is 200 IO per second. This is much too small for huge uh, SSD disk. SSD disk can, uh, can do 10,000 to 100,000 IOs. Okay, that's our MySQL variables influencing writes. What influencing the access patterns? So, sequential. InnoDB primary key is fundamentally important for the access pattern. Why? Uh, because InnoDB tables are clustered by the primary key. That means, means the selection of the primary key influences how the rows are sorted in the tables. Okay? So you, when you create a table, you decide how the rows are physically sorted on disk and in memory. Yes, that's true. Only by InnoDB, huh? That means auto increment is typically good. The rows are sorted by time increasing. That's typically what we want. The highest numbers is in cache, and the highest numbers are the newest data, are the hot data. We want to have them in RAM. That's good. Uh, what also influences sequential access pattern is covering indexes. If you know we want to have a select on A, B, C, D, E, and not from the whole table, you can create an index on A, B, C, D, E, and the rows in the index are always sorted according to this pattern. So get a sequential scan through the index on the cost of more disk, on the cost of more maintenance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Random patterns, InnoDB primary key. Who was the guy talking about merging and federation? And... Ah, he left the room. Okay. Ah, here you are. Um, what I have seen with ERP systems, they are made for that. They want to merge two companies. And they like to use UUIDs. From the InnoDB point of view, this is really, really bad. What are you using? It's auto increment. Auto increment. Whew. Yeah, uh, most of them, the few not, but most of them are auto increment. Okay. So bash, bad uh, primary keys would be hash. But why? Any idea? Anybody? Sort of it's completely random. That means our data are spread over the 100 gigabyte data, so we don't have really a hot data set because everything is hot. Okay, a little bit less worse is UUID. This depends on the version of the implementation of UUID. It changes on the left side and it hops around uh, after I don't know how many numbers, it starts again from the beginning. So you have a chunk of rows, and then suddenly a chunk of rows, and a chunk of rows, which does not really mean we have a really concentration of hot data. So pay, uh, pay attention with such kind of primary keys. Non-covering indexes means we can make a range scan on the index, which leads then later to random access to the table. And as bigger the random access on the table is, as more expensive it becomes. Just imagine an index of gender. 
Average distribution, 49, 49, 2. Okay? So if you say, go to the index of gender and select all females, it will have a range on the index, but then 50% of the rows from the tables in random access, which is really, really bad. So pay attention on this kind of huge ranges on indexes, non-covering indexes. So let's talk about high availability and performance. As I understood, NextCloud is critical infrastructure, right? So we need some kind of high availability. Yes? OK. Uh, what do you recommend for high availability database solution? So we recommend the, the Galera cluster. OK. And they are in master slate set up. OK. And usually, if you have performance issues, you try to put the proxy like Nextcloud in front of it. Okay. To uh, spread the reads to the slaves and the writes to the master. Okay. You are aware that Nextcloud is not open source anymore, right? Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, that's sometimes how we scale our performance because most of the requests are reads. Yeah. And okay. And can better then it makes sense. Be yeah. Moved to the slaves. And you know that uh, read write splitting only works for um, auto commits. Yeah. Okay. Good. That's also yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So a general misunderstanding of the concept of clusters is I see every time that the customers clusters are typically not for performance; they are for high availability, and this does not match to each other. Huh? So it's either performance or high availability, but typically not both, or mostly not both. I don't know why people always think a cluster is for high performance. Maybe because of the top 500, where we always are talking about high performance, but that's not what we do. We have primarily high availability clusters. So what we have is master slave. Oh, that should be a MM, master, master. So it's asynchronous, and that's fast. That's good. And then, as you said, uh, we also have Galera. And this is synchronous. That means it's slower. Synchronous always means I have to wait. So if I have to wait, I'm not as fast if, uh, compared to if I do not have to wait. So it's always a question between synchronous and asynchronous. So it's a question between Galera and master slave. Uh, sharding is another thing to get high availability and more throughput. You, you say that if you have multi-tenant installation, you do some kind of, st of sharding. You can and multi-tenancy is only, uh, you, you get multi-tenancy by setting up multiple instances. You can use federated sharing to, so there, can, there's no awareness of the software. So you have to set up multi-nextcloud instances as yes. well, so there is no nextcloud knows that yes. part, okay. But, but uh, there are a lot for the pure. OK, feature request for the future in Nextcloud 13. This will be included. OK, great. OK, so sharding will be in next, next cloud. Otherwise, MySQL has fabrics. But yeah, OK, if you do it yourself, it's better. So do it yourself. So you have it completely under control. Another thing that's very problematic, high availability is not KISS. KISS, uh, keep it stupid simple. So keep it easy. If you have a very experienced uh, DBA or Unix administrator group, then it's OK. But we very often have customers, 10,000 employees and three people in the IT department. They have to take care of Microsoft Exchange Server, Microsoft, uh, how do you call this, mail stuff. And then I say, oh, there is a Galera cluster on Linux. You can imagine how fast it will break. It has nothing to do with Galera, but clusters are complicated. Last week, oh no, wait, it was this week, I had a very clever customer, a Windows-only company. They have to install Linux, but they say, oh, we don't want to have a cluster because clusters break more often than single instances. So that depends a little bit on your philosophy. Just keep in mind, high availability is not keys. And with keys, you typically don't get high availability. So you have to decide again. And then, question to your developers, maybe you can say yes, your, your software must be cluster aware. This is not a Galera or MySQL specific problem. This is always a problem with clustered setups. The software must also be capable to deal with the cluster. This is very often a problem with Galera. They say, oh, we use a Galera cluster, and then Galera has some disadvantages or has special functionality, and the software cannot cope with that. But you say yes, you support it, so Next cloud is clusterware. Good. So Galera and performance 
I compare here single instance and Galera. What do we expect from different patterns? So read latency, we typically expect the same latency than a single node instance or master slave. Write performance, you say you don't do a lot of writes, so it's not an issue, but write performance or la write latency is worse because if I write to this node, I have to wait to the group unless, uh, until they say, yes, we have it. Okay, so write latency in Galera is worse. Throughput read is bigger because you can spread all your reads to many Galera nodes. What you do according to your statement, yeah, right? What do you recommend? What do you recommend? Do you okay. recommend if it's set up? If the, if the customer sets up and there are customers say, yeah, keep in mind to set it up like this. Okay. So what about write throughput? <clears throat> this is equal to a MySQL daemon or maybe a little bit bigger. But we don't have a big issue with writing according to you. Okay. Uh, then a mistake we see very often with Galera setup, that's for you as a user again, uh, don't set InnoDB flush log a transaction commit to one on the Galera cluster. It will become heavily, uh, horribly slow. Okay. In Galera, we can say if we get the okay from the other nodes, it's on other machines, the data. So if we get a power off, if we crash, we can assure the data over there. So we don't have to wait for the low, slow disk. So that's the reason why in Galera it's okay uh, to set this value non equal one. And that's now a question to you again. Do you know this variable in Galera? We have to sync wait. No? Galera, okay. Galera claims to be a virtual synchronous cluster. So your neck hair should stand up. Why? Because you find out a view of stuff that isn't written on the other. Okay, so first of all, virtual synchronous means it's not synchronous. Otherwise, I don't need this word virtual. So what does it mean, virtual synchronous? Virtual synchronous means they have the data over there, but it's not visible yet. That means you write to one Galera node by default, and if you read immediately after on the other node, it's not arrived yet there. So it's some kind of semi-synchronous or asynchronous. You are aware of that? Yes. Okay, that's good. So what do you recommend? Full synchronous or virtual synchronous? Usually we recommend the full synchronous one okay. because of the drawbacks otherwise, but we then uh, often it's then monitored and yeah, then the latency is a bit. Okay, so then the read latency will become longer. It has an impact on the read. So it's a question, do you really need it or don't you need it? Yeah, often it's only because the writes the are there mm -hmm. and they are, don't have that often. So to make it a little, bit, a little bit more interesting for you, you can set a per session. So if you know in your session, oh, this is really time critical, you can say set session real synchronous and all the others is semi. Okay. So what is evil? Uh, missing indexes, I hope we don't have any more, otherwise I will tell you how to find. Bad filters, uh, this happens very often with very flexible user forms. I can filter by this and this and this and this and gender and date and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you developers have to make sure that the, uh, that the user forms are not too flexible. And then we have a competition with the sales guy, where is it? He has a user request and then technical and doesn't match. match. Bad indexes, too many indexes can also hurt. Not that much than missing indexes, but you should not overdo with indexing. Then complex queries again, frameworks. Select star is mostly not that evil. We hear very often, oh, select star is really, really, really evil. That's only partly true. So don't focus on select star, focus on the filters. Focus on the indexes, that's much more important. Subqueries, uh, for my school up to my school 5.5, subqueries was always a problem, also for other databases. Uh, in my school 5.6, it became a little bit better, but it's still a problem. So whenever possible, you as a developer don't use subqueries, write a join if possible. The my school users manual, there are some hints what you can, what subqueries you can rewrite to joins. Then too many table joins, so if you join 30 tables together, it will not perform. Some frameworks do that. So please avoid, it will give slow queries. Long primary keys, that means the join fields, 
uh, makes it slower. You have more CPU cycles. So keep the primary keys short. Avoid hash, UUID, and similar stuff on primary keys. Auto increment is mostly good, except if you have time series. Then auto increment is suboptimal. Blob and text and other trash should not be in the hot tables. It spoils your RAM, your buffer pool, so move them to another table which is less important to a cold or warm table. So split a table into hot and warm part to keep the blobs, pictures, whatever you store somewhere else. And then such things like log files, mouse click tracking, monitoring, and something you told me before in the, in the last presentation, somebody, such patterns, you should not store in the database. There are better stores for it, for logs, trash, and so stuff. Are you doing that? Wait, wait, the documents and timestamps. Do you, do you store timestamps and document, last thread and such stuff? Okay. Yeah, if it happens in huge amounts, that could become a problem. The idea is to see that there was a in front of it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, mail, mail, huh? Every read I write to the database. No, it, was, or, it wasn't Thunderbird when the Thunderbird directory was synced and there was a huge load on the database because Thunderbird touched the file. Yeah, so every mail it touched and then yeah, and it has an impact. Yeah, yeah, such, such things is not really good for the database. Yeah. We, we generally we don't do writes to the database if we do user only reads information from the website. Okay, no, that sounds good. So I'm optimistic that it should perform. We do try. Yeah, okay. Then if not, uh, we can discuss about it where we should do something. So that's more or less I have to talk about database performance and scalability stuff. Uh, any questions up to you? No, come on. Do you want to go for lunch or what? <laughs> okay, so if there are no more questions, uh, I will be here all the day. I will leave around 6 o'clock, so you can ask me later or yours or the others will know where you can find me and ask. Okay, thank you very much for listening and enjoy lunch.